This is another series of webinars about Australia as an important market for global entrepreneurs who is exploring opportunities around the world, entering different markets. And Australia is one of those uh, interesting and important markets uh, for international founders. And uh, now I would like uh, to pass the word uh, to our speakers. Uh, we're going to talk on the topic uh, how to scale B2B startups in Australia. And let's start with Sharon. Sharon, tell us about yourself. Tell us about the Gold Coast Innovation Hub and the opportunity for B2B startups. Um, so yes, thank you so much, Daniil, for having me um, on this webinar today. It's great to connect with you guys again. And we love the work that uh, Go, Go Global World are doing um, to help to unite um, entrepreneurs all over the world. It's very similar to our goals um, from the Innovation Hub. So it was wonderful to be able to connect up with another entity that can help us in this way. Um, so I was asked today to speak about scaling B2B businesses um, from Australia. Now, specifically, um, when we're talking about B2B businesses in this context, we're really talking about enterprise um, startups. So companies that are trying to break into existing, um, usually quite large scale businesses. Um, and there are obviously some barriers that you address as a very new company when these things happen. Um, so I'm gonna quickly talk a little bit about myself first and then continue on. So a little bit about me, um, I, my background is in IT. I spent a lot of time in uh, just corporate IT space as well as having um, a couple of my own companies along the way. I started my first business when I was 23. Um, when I moved to the Gold Coast about 10 years ago, uh, I, I guess at about that time I started to um, look at this, what was happening in the startup scene uh, in Silicon Valley overseas and what was starting to happen in uh, Sydney, Australia, and, you know, really wanted to see um, more of that technology activity, um, digital technology taking off on the Gold Coast um, and seeing um, great global companies being out of scale from um, the, a regional city like the Gold Coast. So, Run, run, I've run lots of startup events, lots of programs, and through one of those events, I was lucky enough to meet Danny, who you'll meet um, soon, and, uh, and I joined his company, um, OpManTech, in 2014, um, right when it was at a very, at the very sort of starting stages of early stage high growth, uh, and got to experience um, firsthand what it's like um, as an early stage um, startup to, to be trying to scale an enterprise software solution uh, globally. Um, in 2017, we launched the Gold Coast Innovation Hub. Um, and the idea behind that was to leverage partnerships and knowledge and connections, um, both that we had managed to build through Opmantec um, and, and, and that other companies that were now reaching a good um, stage of scaling uh, across the Gold Coast and to use that to help other companies to be able to uh, fast track their growth uh, internationally. So when we started the Gold Coast Innovation Hub, we had a bit of a vision for it, which was that we wanted to see every startup founder, every innovator, every partner, investor, and anyone that wanted to support the Gold Coast Innovation Ecosystem to feel like if they were part of the Innovation Hub, then they would have a greater access to funding, better access to skills and knowledge, better access to support and a greater access to community. And so therefore they would have a greater chance of success than if they were going it alone. So we've been here for four years now. Uh, locally, we have a network of 4,000 local startup founders in the Gold Coast region. Uh, we have 70 vetted mentors that provide support they are either uh, entrepreneurs that have already built um, successful companies or subject matter experts uh, that are able to um, assist companies uh, in areas like law, accounting, um, different bits and pieces like that. Uh, we've got 100 businesses currently enrolled in our, um, in our uh, programs and we have 320 companies connected by our online portal. So those programs are accelerator programs, incubator programs, uh, and uh, pre-accelerator programs. 
We also have 12 international partners, Go Global World being one of them, and over 30 local and national partnerships that help the companies within the Innovation Hub community to grow and scale. So what are the B2B challenges uh, that companies face or startup companies face? So I, I feel like that there are lots, but there are really three main ones that kind of come to mind for me or that we've ex I've experienced myself uh, when going through the, the scaling process and trying to get those first customer sales um, as, as a startup company. So first it's relationship constraints. So as a new uh, founder, you generally um, will not have the right connections to be able to get into the companies that you're wanting to sell your products to. You're not well known. There's a, I think there's a saying in the industry, which is always like, you can't go wrong with IBM, things like that. So a lot of the time you're going up against well-known brands uh, that people know and trust. And then, so as an early stage startup, how do you um, build some trust with companies that can't really see a, a presence and evidence um, of your um, ability and, and stability to be able to, um, for them to be able to trust their company with your software? The second is procurement constraints. So there's, if you're selling into larger organizations, there are generally things like budget cycles that you need to be aware of. A lot of larger companies use tendering processes and even the, pro the process of applying for a tender, but also being able to meet all the requirements of a tender when you are an early stage startup is also a big hindrance to being able to get into uh, these larger organizations. And then of course you have resource constraints. Um, so you are, um, you're, you're new, you're, uh, you've got a small team, you're stretched already. And so being able to um, deliver on early stage contracts and, and being able to compete against existing uh, companies that you may be up against, again, is much more difficult when you're an early stage startup. So I was asked to talk about some of the things that we do at the Innovation Hub um, to try and combat these challenges. Um, and so when it comes to the relationships, um, we feel that an Innovation Hub has a key role in helping to build um, relationships for early stage startups. Um, so how do we do that? Um, we try and do that through creating um, uh, trusted partners, creating connections through trusted international partners. So these are organisations um, that we uh, that we uh, have already got relationships with. So this could be companies. Uh, so this could be previous sales relationships. So um, which we are then able to leverage for other startups um, that we see have potential, but also our existing relationships with government um, and with uh, and with innovation spaces uh, across the world that that actually have um, reputation with uh, within their cities, so that um, so that they can help to make connections into other uh, into existing companies for startups. Second, of course, is sharing success stories. So even though this sounds a little bit fluffy, um, you know, I don't think you can, um, when you look at like Atlassian, for example, um, the work that they've done um, in creating a reputation for Australian enterprise software is huge. Um, and it allows other companies to then be able to follow, um, or, or I guess leverage that great reputation to be able to then um, move into those um, to more easily move into those businesses as well. Um, and so creating case studies and references um, that can be used to help other B2B startups. So creating industry accelerators, um, working with industry to create pitch events um, and creating internal innovation programs. So working with internal teams within uh, corporates to be able to introduce new technologies through proof of concept working with startups to collaborate on tenders and, pro, uh, and proposals. So um, connecting startups to um, ex experienced systems integrators, for example, that can actually pair up with you on the tendering process and help to meet some of the requirements um, and, pro and provide that sort of trusted uh, brand 
uh, while introducing new technologies uh, which are being built by the startups and also providing templates and tools uh, for startup sales teams. So case studies, business uh, cases, so templates that uh, businesses can, that our startups can use to then be able to um, uh, 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 build those sales relationships that they need. Uh, finally, um, extending startup resources. So, um, so the hub, our hub likes to act a little bit like you were talking about, Danil. There, um, so we are a community, and so we like uh, uh, the members of the community can always feel like they can leverage that community to extend their team. So, using the connections between the service providers, other startups within the space, to be able to uh, build out their team when they need extra resources. Uh, and also um, providing access to tools and processes and knowledge um, that can help to close deals faster. Um, we even uh, like we even do things like I'll, I'll quite often sit, go into a sales meeting with one of our startups that we're working with um, and, and, and sort of support them in their presentation. Um, so they, you know, feels like their team's a little bigger. They've got uh, more and, and the people that they're selling to can see that they've got people around them that can help them to scale and grow. So I was fi the final point, I was asked to talk about scaling B2B startups from Australia during COVID. And it's a really, really interesting time for us, uh, for people in, in Australia to, to be making these sales because for a very long time, um, we've always been quite separated from the rest of the world. There's a big, uh, there's a, it's quite a long, plane journey to get to anywhere from Australia, whether you're going to Southeast Asia uh, or the US or the UK. Um, so from we are separated by distance significantly. But with the event of COVID and everyone being locked down, it's sort of we're kind of in a place now where it's almost as easy for me to jump on a call um, to someone in, uh, in uh, Southeast Asia, so in Singapore, India, um, as it is for them to jump on a call with someone that's in the next suburb from them. Um, so, you know, so if we've gone from being a seven or eight hour flight away to basically being a two hour times difference on Zoom, which let's face it, as entrepreneurs, we don't really, <laughs> we don't really care if we're working nine to five anyway. So that's disappeared. The other thing that's disappeared is this, uh, there was always, particularly when you're dealing with enterprise software and, and, and doing enterprise sales, there was always a long drawn out sales cycle that required an awful lot of face-to-face -face negotiations and smoozing. So, you know, going out, meeting with the key people, having lunches, all those sorts of things. And nearly every deal never closed until you were sitting there in a room together and you signed the piece of paper. It was expensive. It was drawn out. Um, and it was hard to compete against larger companies that were already in the market. Um, but now that's all sort of gone away. So we're signing deals, uh, we're, we're doing the deal, the negotiation over Zoom, we're signing things digitally. And if you are an agile company um, and, an, and you know, uh, like a lot of software companies in Australia where you're building the tech and your engineering team is here, you're selling internationally, uh, we know how to do remote deployment of software. And so, you know, and we can do it better than anyone else, I think. So the um, so we've got a real advantage there to be able to, you know, to with a with a smaller gap um, and with uh, with great expertise and great ability to be able to deliver things remotely. Um, we've got a great opportunity to be signing more deals internationally. So and we've certainly seen that within the Innovation Hub. We've seen a lot of new traction. So I'm going to stop talking now because I know there's two other presentations to go. Uh, so thank you for the for the time, Daniel, and I look forward to questions afterwards. Thank you so much, Sharon. Uh, as always, great. And uh, uh, I really mm, like uh, the thing that we can explore Australian Australian point of view because uh, currently, uh, especially being in the states, we are focused only on the states and uh, entrepreneurship in the states. And, uh, but now ecosystem is all uh, united and uh, uh, we need to build these connections. And one of those uh, kind of talks we create together, I think this cre creates this collaboration. 
Thank you. Uh, now, Danny, uh, your turn. Uh, please tell us about yourself, uh, 42 Ventures, and uh, on the topic, uh, uh, how to scale into uh, uh, Australia and outside Australia for B2B startups. Great, okay. Um, hello, everyone. I'm, I'm Danny Ma from 42 Ventures. Um, so my, my background, these days I'm a, a tech investor and I'm a chairman of a tech investment fund, but um, historically I'm a commercializer of innovation and, and I'm an entrepreneur. Um, so like many of you have been entrepreneurs and investors or, and currently maybe one or the other, but that's, that's uh, life. Um, I built a, a company um, in Sydney called Netstar. I took that to 42 countries. Um, I was the only executive investor there and we, we sold it um, to us together with um, one of Australia's first um, venture capital firms and bearing private equity partners out of Hong Kong and we sold it to Logicalis and UK. Um, prior to that, um, I'd been involved in exec roles in quite a few companies uh, and a lot of different acquisitions. So I was always joining high growth entrepreneurial companies. Um, and you know, I've had basically an acquisition with company I was a work, work with um, every 22 months, some very successful and some not so successful, successful as you would expect. Um, my current favorite project, I guess, is Opmantec, um, which is a, a B2B, commercial open source software company. There's 150,000 organizations around the world that use Opmantec products. They're in the field of network management and intelligent network management and IT audit. Um, we founded them on the Gold Coast to try and help change the ecosystem at the Gold Coast really. Uh, won, won a bunch of awards and it, it gets an, Opmantec gets a new client every one and a half minutes and is said to be possibly the fastest growing business software company in the world. Um, so I've got a lot of uh, fun things going on. Um, so to try and hone in on, uh, on um, the topics we're going to talk about, the first thing I often say is don't believe me and don't believe anyone. You know, you, you guys are the entrepreneurs and there's a quote attributed to Buddha, but it's not actually Buddha. But, uh, you know, it says, believe nothing, no matter where you read it or who said it, no matter if I have said it, unless it agrees with your own reason, your own common sense. So basically, you decide, decide. <laughs> you decide what you need to become to be wiser, and no, no one else can do that. Um, and this, that sentence is quite purposely written in a puzzling way. So it, it's up to you to decide what makes sense to you. If you can make sense of that sentence, if you can make sense of the quote. Um, so if you hear things today that are good for you, great. And if you hear things that don't make sense to you, they're not for you. That's okay. Um, we've all got our own. Um, own path and, and purpose. So you seek the mentors that you need and the advice that you need and things that don't make sense, don't worry about it. Um, so that's the first thing I say. Second thing I always say on these is, is, is a business safari because entre entrepreneurship is like a safari. It's not, if you want to be on a, if you want to be a train driver, you join a, join a corporate, particularly a multinational corporate where they tell you the timetable and you go and execute it. But when you're in business, it's a safari and Anything that you plan as simple will become complex and anything that you plan as complex, you will never achieve. So don't ever think that anything is too simple, that no one will buy something because it's too simple. Um, it will become complex. Um, so, you know, you start simple and the complexity will come. Don't worry about that. If you start complex, you, you're not going to achieve anything. Um, these are the, just talking about business in general and forming a B2B business, um, these are the stages of a business that I define. Um, so the dreaming, um, that's an Aboriginal term in Australia. If you're a religious person, this is about the creation, you know, when God created the, the earth in seven days or whatever your beliefs are. Um, and, and basically, like, if, if you're religious, if God created the world, he didn't create the way that we're living the world now. He just did the first seven days, and then we adapted and pivoted, as you might say, in tech and went from there. But that's where it starts, that, that time where you decide to do something, and you get off the lounge, and you actually do something, and everything flows from there. Then I, then I call the next stage existing, okay? And I like to talk a little bit about this to entrepreneurs, because it's a, it's a really troublesome stage, because... You find the people that are close to you in your life aren't supporting you the way that you would expect. So you'd think your wife or your partner or your friend will, will back your idea. 
And they're probably in your ear saying, why don't you go and get a real job? This business is never going to go anywhere. It's not successful. We're not earning any money that, you know, and these are the people that you expect to be supporting you. And so I want to let you know that so that you know it's normal. Um, when you're in that stage of your business, the people you expect to support you don't. And it's normal. Um, and that's when you're, you're running around trying to convince everyone you've got a real business. Uh, the next stage I call is validation of your existence, okay? And this is an exciting stage. And this is all of a sudden, all the stuff you've been telling everyone that you're real, everyone's believing it and you're panicking. You're going, oh my God, everyone's all of a sudden believing the things I've been telling them and they're not true at all. Um, and so, so everything flips around. You, you've gone from trying to convince everyone you're real and now people think you're more real than you are. Um, again, that's normal. And all of a sudden that person that wouldn't support you, your partner, your friend, starts saying it's our business or else somehow tries to want to associate themselves with it. And, and that's when they start validating that you exist as a business. Um, they're, they're the early stages of a business, uh, including high growth. There's a lot of validation during high growth. And then from there, I say you move on to living. That's where everything's in balance. You know who you are. People know who you are. Mastery. That's when you're Apple or Google and those types of company. And then reinvention, right? And you go back to the start. You go back to the dreamy again. And, you know, I, I guess I just mentioned Apple and they're, they're probably um, one of the best examples of reinvention, you know, where they went back to the start, you know. Um, so that, that's the stages that, that, I, that I have. Um, different... Um, there's different aspects for investors and, and different aspects for people growing a business. Your focus will change, you know, in those early stages, it's all about customer growth should always be first and then minimum viable product. Or I often say, I often say minimum viable everything, you know, it's minimum viable business plan, minimum viable marketing, minimum viable everything, you know, not, not even just product, you just get going. Um, but you'll find, you know, as you progress through the stages, um, you know, that becomes less of a priority and hiring becomes more of a priority. Um, market fit becomes more, more of a priority and those, those types of things. So just give, giving a very quick overview. Um, and I just put this slide up. There's a lot of data behind this slide from a lot of res resources. But again, this is just to encourage entrepreneurs that if things aren't going as well as you thought, um, that's normal as well. Um, so this is how people estimate market size and, and their business performance goes along with that naturally. And um, it, it says two things. One is use mentors. And, and you also see that mentors, even at the early stages, will underestimate how well you're going to do um, compared to you. So um, and when you get to the living stage, everything's in balance. You know, everyone knows where things are at. So, um, so yeah, if your business isn't doing as well as you think, or your mentor's telling you you're not going to do as well as you want, again, that's 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 normal. But probably your mentor is going to be closer to reality than you are. <laughs> um, I mentioned minimum viable everything. Um, one of one of the I noticed it in the um, um, brief that Daniel sent out, um, he talked about why would organisations buy first. So you're an early stage business B two B company. Um, Sharon mentioned. Um, you never get fired for buying IBM. That's a really old saying, and that, that world is changing. Um, people are understanding that they need to find ways to engage with early, early suppliers. But she also said that you're going to come up against people with bigger market share, more proven products, and all those types of things, which is absolutely right. And it's really hard to sell against someone that has more customers than you and a better proven product than you. So... Some of the things that I use in an early stage business are statements such as um, we're allowing a small number of organizations with appropriate skills, so you're playing to their ego, to engage directly with our product development team. Okay, it, so if they, if they deal with Microsoft, you're getting a Microsoft or a large organization, you can't have Microsoft Word modified. You can't have Excel modified. You can't have, with any of those large software companies, they're not gonna modify the product for them. You might customize it for yourself, but it's not going to become part of your core product. So when you're early stage, that's a key value add. You can go to a, a client and you can say, we will build the product that you want into our core product and it will become part of our product forever and something that we support. It's not going to be a custom solution. And once we've got 20 customers, you're not going to have that opportunity. So that's an opportunity for you now and it's going to go away for us to build the product you want at, at, um, into our core product. And assuming their request can be reused marketed, you're gonna adapt the product for them for free. And that's the best way to build your products anyway. 
Build it on cu what customers want, not what you think they want. Um, you'll oversee the implementation themselves and you'll ensure the success. You know, your business depends on the success of that project. And that's really another powerful statement for them. Why, why should they go with someone that doesn't really matter to them how the project goes? To you, you're an expert, you're gonna be there and ensure, ensure success. And you'll co-fund it if there'll be a reference. You're not gonna, and they don't really know what it's gonna cost you to develop by the way, but, um, but you're gonna invest in development, you're gonna invest in building your business and you're gonna co-fund this if there'll be a reference. So they're gonna get the product they want at a lower cost and with a higher chance of success because you're gonna be there working with them. So, so they're the, the types of things I use when I'm an early stage business to sell to someone when I'm competing against established organizations. Um, unfortunately, your competitive advantage is always your customers. And when you're early stage, they're gonna have more than that. So as soon as you get your one customer, your two customers, their story, their case study is more important than anything your product does. Customers follow customers, full stop. There's very few people out there in the business world, I'm not talking consumer world, business world, that have the time to assess new technologies and the skills to really understand that it's better than something else they look at. They're gonna go with something credible. What, what makes it credible? Customers. So as soon as you have a customer, that's the thing to leverage. You can forget about your products straight away. Leverage your customers and you'll get more customers. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about attracting investment, um, and I know that there's there's um, more more to come on this. Um, um, no one invests in something they can't understand. So if you're trying to get investment, make sure you're talking about it in a way people can understand. If, if you think they're not smart enough because they didn't understand your pitch, it's your problem. It's not theirs. Okay. Um, you get dollars from customers if you can. Customers, customers, customers. It's better than getting it from investors. If you think you're successful because you got money from investors, you're not. If you, if you get investment on a business plan and then blindly go and execute it, you, you're in trouble. You know, you, you need to stay nimble because you need to be getting customers. So if you get investment, you're at the starting line. That's it. You haven't succeeded anywhere. You have to get customers. Um, basically, very quickly, places you get investment, pre-revenue, you won't get your own idea funded unless you post something, okay? It doesn't have to be post revenue, but it has to be post something. If you've only got an idea, it's only your friends, family, fools, okay? People that you know that are gonna help you and believe in you. You might have some, rather than spending money, you might be able to have some people work for equity. You might even have a customer that, um, you know, agrees to be a client and takes an investment rather than, rather than writing you a check for 300,000. They might say, okay, I'll give you a check for 300,000, but I want 5% of the company, you know, for example. And you may or may not want that. Um, when you just post revenue, it's typically angel groups or investment groups like Wholesale Investor that we're going to hear from. And later than that, when you're in growth, that tends to be more the VC and, and also the investment groups again. Okay. Um, and there, there are different types of investors, like angels will want to be hands on, investment groups probably don't, but might be a little bit. And VCs will tend to want a board seat, but want to back, back you if, if you can do what, what, what they want. Um, just very, very quickly on Australia. Um, so why would you, why would you build in a business in Australia um, versus elsewhere in the world? You actually probably wouldn't. There's not, there's not many people who, who are in Germany and go, wow, I've invented something. I need to move to Australia. Uh, you know, we're in Queensland, the Gold Coast here. There's not many people in Sydney who invent something and go, I need to move to the Gold Coast. Um, so um, it's not a natural choice necessarily. And places like the Gold Coast Innovation Hub that Sharon had, had mentioned are critical because they, they, they what create the connections from this place. So when you hear people say, we well, can build a business, business anywhere, you can, but you need an innovation hub or something like that that creates the connections. Um, but Australia is a great place to build a business. It's a small market, okay? So you can get market penetration easier. It's easy to establish here and grow here than elsewhere. Um, it, we're a developed country. We take up new innovations really quickly. We're a wealthy country, especially in certain industries, but we have very wealthy companies, wealthy government, uh, and, um, and we're also a cultural bridge for Asia, which is a huge market. So if you're a Western country, you know, from a Western country trying to get in Asia, this is a great, place to be. So they're, they're the things to leverage in Australia. Um, there's many organisations that help you, for, whether it's the hub or government departments. Um, you, get, you get way more help in growing an innovative business in Australia than you do in most countries. 
The tech industry is 6% of Australia's GDP, um, which is a lot. You know, if I, you look at around 5% of the workforce. So one out of 20 people you would meet in Australia work in tech. That's a lot. Um, and 90% of the tech companies are SMBs, small and medium businesses. So this is a real startup um, place. Once you get to high growth and you progress, we typically go and sell to a US company or we move over to the US or, or England or somewhere like that. Um, people here get early exposure to senior roles in international business. When you're in a small, you know, we're, we're a small economy. That means people become CEOs really early in life. They get exposure to, you know, they become director of Asia Pacific and those types of things. Whereas if you're in the US or the UK, you're still probably managing a division in your own city. So, so, you, so you do get quite worldly experience here, especially for Asia. And you have a lot of tech people and we're very good with small and medium businesses. Um, you can see this is a slide where a marketing person has touched rather than <laughs> something I've hacked together myself. Um, and I'll just finish off here pretty quickly. So there's a lot of incentives in Australia for people to invest in tech. Um, there, there's some incredible incentives actually. Um, there's lots of, um, lots of grants for the company. So typically if you take a dollar investment in an Australian company, you're gonna get th between three and three to six times that in free government from the money, free money from the government. So it's a really cool place to grow a business. And there's access to lots of programs. We just learned about the hub and, and there's lots of government programs as well. Okay, so if, if, you, if you invest in, in tech in Australia, um, it's um, often, um, so if you look at the, our 42 Ventures Fund um, that I chair, um, you know, anyway, it's often tax-free. So there's, there's no capital gains on early stage investments in Australia. Okay, and that includes for international investors. International investors can get permanent residency in Australia and, and, and get, res, res, get Australian passport and become a resident of Australia. Um, so there's lots and lots of things that stimulate investment in Australia. But if you look at the, the levels of the checks in Australia, that's where they're at. You know, like, like our fund, an investment fund in Australia is probably 20 million US. You know, you know, we've got some larger ones and some smaller ones, of course, but they're, they're not as big as US or, or European. Um, and angel investments can be quite small, um, you know, and so, so it's a, it is a different investment landscape. Um, Australia has the highest number of people that own stock in any country in the world, okay? So, and if you look at the performance of our tech stocks versus the stock market, and by the way, the stock market here performs very well, um, it, it far surpasses the regular stock market here. So tech is hot for investors here, um, but don't think for a moment we have the level of investment like the US or England or lots of places in Europe, but it's a, it is a, it is a um, good place for tech companies. Um, and I mentioned some of these things. So when you invest in tech in Australia, the government gives you 10% cash back or 20% sometimes. Um, you don't pay any income tax. You, you don't pay capital gains tax. And if you're foreign, you get, can get permanent, permanent residency. So um, anyway, that's the beginning, as I say, because you guys will be the ones that determine the end. Uh, and I'll, I'll uh, finish my presentation there and welcome some questions later. Thank you so much, uh, Danny. It's actually a great presentation. And uh, I, mm, I, I like your personal approach to uh, sharing your personal expertise uh, for founders. Uh, uh, you know, sometimes people go general and uh, on some specific topics, but definitely what I see here, your personal expertise in dealing with uh, all those founders uh, with your, uh, the entire uh, expertise you gained. Um, thank you so much. Steve, uh, your turn. Tell us about yourself, uh, about your company, and uh, I'll show you as the slides you were preparing for us. Sure. Thanks, Daniel. So, look, basically, for, for me, uh, I launched Wholesale Investor back in October 2008. So just as the Dow Jones was crashing, we were actually launching a magazine in this area. And actually, what most people don't know is I was living on the Gold Coast when I actually launched Wholesale Investor. And more than and not and what was funny is I actually moved to Sydney because there was no ecosystem there whatsoever at that time, and uh, I remember Opmantic from the er very very early days, um, sort of, and, and I remember being really impressed by you know obviously what they'd achieved at that time. So um, I, I really love what you're doing, and exactly, and 
effectively everything Danny said was just so accurate from a capital raising uh, perspective. So um, Wholesale Investor is a platform. We work with growth companies that are basically seeking to raise capital. Um, we build a database of high net worths and uh, venture investors across Australia, Singapore, and the UK. Um, and my slides that I'm going to be talking about is just really, my, it's basically, you know, I've done a deep dive on the capital raising process for myself for the last sort of two and a half years and basically experimented with my own business. Uh, and in that journey, I've basically tried to understand what, how it all kicked off was I had uh, someone come, I basically had an advisor come and say to me that, you know, oh, I'll go and raise money for you. We'll do this. We'll do that. And the way they said it to me, I, I didn't doubt them. And even though I had my own platform, I liked the idea that someone else was going to raise money for me and I could just focus on building the business. And that philosophy tend to be a, a very bad one because effectively after six months of not raising anything, it left me in a massive amount of pressure at that time. And then that's when I started going down this journey of I wanted to try and un, how do, I wanted to understand how do I turn capital raising from art or a mysterious dark art into a science and into an actual process. And so basically, I, I think I sort of kick off uh, where, where, where Denny left off as far as how I, what I've sort of learned about this process. And let me just screen larger. Okay, so effectively, the topic I'm gonna to talk about is building your capital raising brand. Now, the reason why I call it brand is because when, what I've found in promoting, you know, thousands of companies over the last 12 years, you effectively got seconds to capture an investor's attention, right? We're all basically borderline ADHD. We all like shining new objects. We've all got, you know, you know, Danny's probably looking at 15 to 30 different opportunities this month alone. So how do you capture someone like his attention and, and attract it? And so that's where we really started thinking, that's where I really started thinking about this as, a, as an area. So the first role I always highlight for a founder is our job is to have ourselves go from unknown to known in some way, shape or form, and then obviously to success. And the first step is the hardest in that, you know, Danny mentioned about getting clients and that's obviously one of the best ways to fundraise because you don't really need, and there's lots of great products that help to like, whether it be SaaS financing products or whatever it may be that now assist with that. And so if you can sell a product, it does make life easier and there's less of a requirement for capital raising, which means obviously less dilution. But for me, I said, I, I looked at it from how do I go from unknown to known and then obviously to a success. And then so when I started trying to understand what is the actual buying decision, because if you think about an investment it is effectively a buying decision. And in that there's effectively three stages. The first stage is being obviously awareness where someone becomes aware of you. The second stage is obviously consideration. And the third stage is decision. Now in capital raising, most of us founders would go and pitch investors expecting that they should go from awareness to decision like that, not giving the actual opportunity for that consideration component. So basically what we realize is the problem that we don't, we, we, most of us don't really know that we have with capital raising is the same thing is the what's happened as far as whether it be Blockbuster or just taxis when it comes to Netflix and Uber. And that is simply that if you don't streamline and simplify the process for investors, exactly what Danny said, make it easy for them to understand what your business is and also simplify the process for, for them investing, then you can lose the investor because effectively our competition, when we go to raise capital, is every other company that's competing for, for Danny's money. Like that's our competition when we go to raise. So to think that we're the only ones that are pitching is firstly pretty arrogant on the founder's part. And typically what I find is that I, I like to talk about the Dunning-Kruger effect when it comes to, to raising money because effectively everyone starts out with their optimism at this level, but their skill set at this level. And very quickly they realize the more you actually start capital raising, the more you realize what you don't know. So effectively, we want people to start out expecting that they don't know much and then sort of build, build from there. And for me, I, you know, basically I've now done, I think, 54 videos or something crazy about you know, raising capital just because every time I'd experience something or every time I'd have a client experience something, I would then go and do a, a conversation around as an area. So to understand the, this capital raising, and I've actually, I'm actually playing around with another thesis as well. 
Um, but this to understand what investors look for is obviously the first one is a growing sector. And there's a great saying that a rising tide lifts all boats. Now, some, some investors have specialty sectors that they focus on. Other investors are very thematic in a, as far as they invest, and they're just looking for the themes which they think they can get the highest return. So obviously, uh, wherever people are joining from, everyone will know the buy now, pay later space has been red hot for the last few years. One of the most brilliant branding marketing moves I have seen from a company was a company called Check. Now, no one in Australia knows who Check is, right? But if I tell you that company is now called Before Pay, all of a sudden people seem to know who Before Pay is, even though it's the same company. Now, they changed their name to be obviously similar to one of Australia's, you know, sort of, I suppose, top success stories at the moment, which is Afterpay, and leveraged off that brand, that, that momentum that was taking place in the buy now, pay later. So growing sector, first one. Board and management is the second one, because effectively, board and management is the, the subconscious alluding to the execution capacity of the team that's actually backing the company. Um, and effectively, when the investors are looking at your business, they, what, they're looking at the people involved and understanding what exits that they had, um, what, se what senior profiles and so forth that they've been on, because that gives them um, a perspective on what others see in the potential of your business. Now, bear in mind, people do this often subconsciously, you know, more so than consciously. The, sec the next one is shareholders, skin in the game. So, I find that even if you have small private shareholders in your business, it's still good to reference them because investors, it's that bandwagon effect is often a psychological factor that takes place in a capital raising. So when you start to get momentum, the hardest thing for a capital raising is your first investors. Like the amount of times that a founder will hear who else is coming to the round, who else is participating because they want to understand who else is actually leading the investment. And then if you're very early at the sort of stage that uh, Danny was talking about, it's skin in the game. So as far as understanding that what is your commitment to the success of that business, because the, simply the easiest thing in the world is to quit, right? So understanding what ties, a bit, ties the founder to it is important. Um, for the more technical businesses, I'd say that what can be useful from a marketing perspective is industry awards and even government grants. A lot of listed companies communicate grants that they've received to show that they're obviously investing into research and development, which then alludes to the idea they're investing into future revenue streams. Um, given this is a B2B uh, topic, one of the, when you're communicating to potential investors, there's two powerful things to communicate. Obviously, traction is one of them. But if you've got brand name clients, if you notice that um, when the when you giving the, the, the presentation uh, before him was basically Omantic shows who is some of their, who their clients or what sort of traction they have. So those two things have been able to show who's your brand name client and what is your traction are powerful things to entice an investor to express interest. And that basically goes to those relevant metrics. So for me, if you think about this, how you communicate your business, it is who, who are you, you know, why do you exist? And then if you can put into bullet point these six key areas, it simplifies an investor's mind as far as, okay, all you want to do is get, get them to the point that mentally I'm interested, right? Because then they can go and do a deep dive for a bit more. Because as I said, you're trying to capture people's attention typically within seconds. So I'm not gonna to spend too much time on this, but the elevator pitch, everyone knows. I'm very passionate about people actually mastering this elevator pitch because I've seen far too many founders that just simply don't get past this process because as exactly what Danny said is that they either overcomplicate it, they spend, you know, someone says, so tell me what you do. And then 15 minutes later, they're still talking. That's a bad move, right? Because already they're switched off and want to move on. I've actually got one of the coolest stories of a client that was actually really frustrated with me and with my company. And I sat down with him and I said, Ray, tell me what you do. And then I had that exact thing where he spoke for 15 minutes. So I simplified it down for him to one line. He then ended up raising 500K from an investor. That investor then helped him introduce his own investor networks and ended up raising six and a half million. This investor that we introduced him to was a CEO of a listed, was a former CEO of a listed company. He introduced him to that company. That company acquired him. And then the company went 10x from there. This all happened in the space of 12 months. 
I'll never underestimate the power of an elevator pitch. And that company is called, is uh, the listed company is called Leaf Resources and they acquired Essential Queensland, which is effectively a company in the middle of Queensland that no one knew at the stage. And it was basically a one man, you know, one person on the board. So look, as I, I won't go through these again, but these are all the things that are highlighted as things that you communicate at a high level. And then people always will ask, oh, so I'm too early. I don't have a board. What should I do? I think create this, look at this from a, as a checklist for yourself of things to tick off. Obviously getting customers is powerful. Then get customers, then look to build your board because then as I said, that shows potential and capacity for, for going forward. And then there's a great article this week talking about that series B where it's really about the, you know, the sort of um, the team, the management team that starts to come in to help drive the business. Okay, so I won't, this is the, the, the I, I, won't, I won't go more after this slide, but this sort of goes to what Danny was saying. The mistake that we can make as passionate founders is we wanna talk about everything on the left. We wanna talk about all our daily activities, our products, our nuances, all that sort of stuff. Really what, when you're communicating to investors, just communicate the vision that you see. What is the problem? What is the solution you're solving? Why you the one to do it, but what's that actual vision? And I made this mistake with an investor after pitching him for 90 minutes, he said that, thank you very much. Really enjoyed your passion for, for what you do. He goes, next time, I just want to understand what you want to build. <laughs> I was like, okay, that was humbling. Um, from an investor's perspective, these are all the things that they're afraid of losing. So you always, whilst you're always competing for money, yeah, basically you understand when an investor looks at your opportunity, their loss aversion is around these four factors. First one is money, second is time, Third is reputation if it becomes known. The fourth one is actually the biggest competition for you, which is the another opportunity. So your biggest, uh, op your biggest uh, challenge is once again, when you're raising money, is another opportunity that that investor can invest into. Okay, so I'll, I'll skip through these, but actually I'll just cover quickly. So no investor wants to be the first one in, then they don't want to miss out, understand that. Bandwagon effect is real, whether it be VCs, angel investors, family offices, everyone loves when someone else has gone in first and then they typically follow in, in on that round. And then fear of missing out is obviously the, the last one. So when you get to that stage where your round is 80% funded, then investors don't want to miss out. And that's the key things that investors are looking for. So I will, I will finish there, Daniel. Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Um, hello, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, awesome presentation. Um, uh, thanks for sharing these slides. And uh, um, uh, yeah, we already have plenty of questions, uh, but uh, I just wanted to say that uh, I totally with you, especially for the elevator pitch. Uh, I myself helped uh, lots of founders to raise capital and elevator pitch uh, uh, is also is one of the key things to uh, like break the ice with investors and infect them with an idea and uh, yeah mastering elevator pitch is absolutely crucial in my opinion as well uh, thank you for this great presentation and um, let's get into the questions guys um, we've got uh, tons of uh, questions on uh, our youtube channel um, let's pick the first one uh, um, uh, first of all, guys, uh, everyone is saying thank you to you, uh, uh, to Sharon, to Danny, and to Steve uh, for sharing this information. And the first one is um, to Sharon, how can startups use their resources, uh, or use the resources of Gold Plus Innovation Hub to enter Australia? Uh, um, why should international founders uh, enter Australia? Uh, so um, um, you already answer those questions, but if you can summarize this, uh, Sharon, uh, with the key points. Yeah, sure, I hope you got it. Oh, right. Okay, <laughs> so yep, uh, so there's a few ways. So for starters, um, as an international company at the moment, um, anyone can actually become a member of the Gold Coast Innovation Hub. So if you are building a piece of technology and you think that there is an opportunity for that product to be introduced into the Australian market, we're more than happy, happy to work with you um, to help to introduce you to um, customers and 
uh, and to set up uh, Zoom meetings and things like that. As I said, we're, we're all locked down at the moment. We can get you a Zoom meeting. So, um, so yeah, uh, international startups, we're really happy to act as your um, welcome point into Australia. Um, as an Australian um, B2B startup or any type of startup um, joining the Innovation Hub, um, yeah, we've got a huge network, a huge network of both uh, corporate partners um, of, uh, we're really well connected into the government programs that are available. And of course, we've got our accelerator programs. Um, so we've got a series of those that will be running this year. The first one is a sports tech accelerator that we'll be announcing next week. So if you're building uh, any uh, sorts of technology that um, is relevant to the, the sporting industry, whether that be stadium management or sports team management or sports field management, uh, we've got a really awesome group of um, commercial uh, partners that we're working with um, for that accelerator program, uh, which we can sort of fast track you into the industry. Uh, I think they're like the main things yeah, that we can help. I guess international founders also can uh, apply it. It doesn't matter to be Australian or not, right? As far as I understand. Yep. Awesome. We just want to um, so there is another question, uh, how to raise capital for international founders, uh, like B2B, for example, startups, uh, uh, uh in Australia. Uh, so if they are not Australians and, uh, how would they raise, uh, I, I don't know, uh, who would, who would like to pick, uh, uh this question? Denny? I'm, I'm happy to kick off just given that basically uh, I've got now shareholders from seven different countries uh, and they were all basically from my platform, right? So that was helpful for me to know that I had, the first one that surprised me was a French investment banker uh, that just really liked Australia and he liked coming out to Australia for the Melbourne Cup. And basically I put it in my head that maybe he's investing because uh, he, he wants to come out to Australia more often. But, you know, it said... And also like a so background of PE from uh, Indonesia and Singapore, et cetera. So look, I think going back to what I mentioned is visibility and awareness is one part. And also just tapping into networks said so like with Sharon and Danny, even if they're not going to invest into a company, if they like you, they like what you're doing, but it's not, doesn't fit their mandate, then they may just provide an introduction that could be relevant. Um, so the, the, it's very hard to sell a secret. So you know, I just always highly recommend companies do everything they can to become, uh, you know, to build their awareness about what they do, whether it be through media, whether it be through, um, you know, accelerator programs, demo days, um, platforms, showcase, showcases, whatever it is. I said, it just take the, the, the goal of us as founders is really, we're trying to find that you're always trying to find that one person that can transform, you know, that can assist in helping you transform the trajectory of your business. And sometimes you have to meet a hundred people to find that one. And it's worth the effort for you to be able to, to, to do that. And you can only do that with, with visibility. Yeah. yeah. Once I had the statistics uh, uh, from Silicon Valley in order for you to uh, get one uh, in, uh, VC uh, interested, you got to do uh, 150 uh, pitches to do like to the, to the VCs, so you get one interest in. <laughs> yeah, so, so most of that, I, I, oh, sorry, Danny. Yeah, because Steve, you were mentioning there investors that that come to wholesale investor because they want to invest in Australian companies, and I think that they're asking if they're international, can they get investment from Aussie investors? Um, but I, I think like what you're illustrating there is if if, if people if people want to invest in a company that's in your country, they probably go to a wholesale investor type organization in your country. So if, if an international investor wants to invest in an Australian business, they're gonna get involved with an Australian investment company like Wholesale Investor or 42 Ventures. Um, so if, you're, if, 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 if someone wants to invest in a company from your country, they're probably in your country. Um, that there isn't a lot of international investment. It doesn't matter if you go to the US, they invest in US companies or they make them US companies after they invest in them. Uh, if you go to England, they invest in, invest in mostly English companies, especially now they're not part of Europe. Um, so um, so you, you really should be looking locally in most cases for your, for your investment. And that's a sad reality. Think about your own behaviors. 
if you if you go to buy if you want to go and buy a stock on a public stock exchange you probably buy them on the stock exchange in your own country there's nothing that makes that company better than another company that in, exists somewhere else in the world um, but that's the reality of investor behavior you tend there's a very high tendency to invest in companies that are in your own countries and there's a whole lot of reasons for that so so you, you can get international investment by approaching some international groups and i wouldn't steve would would you think someone, an international company, should approach wholesale investor? Probably wholesale investor is not a way to, not a bad way to go for an international company. But I don't want to get yeah. For down UK, on. for for UK and Singapore companies, we've had traction as far as helping them to to raise. Mm -hmm. But obviously, we we do have databases there, and we have also seen the we've taken we've helped Australian companies raise capital in the UK. From UK investors, um, but they have, typically they'll have to get EIS approval. I think that would be a, a, an important point just to get the tax benefits for the UK. So you need to have someone to assist you with that process, and there's a bunch of things with it. Um, but Singapore, sorry, sorry. no, I was so just I think... going to say Sing Singaporeans typically, if you're Israel, like I do know, there's more and more uh, Singaporean investors that are investing into um, Israeli companies and also looking for and also looking for companies outside of uh, Asia as well. But yeah, as a rule of thumb, like the majority, you find investors do invest in their own areas. Typically, when it's investment outside of their own country, there's something strategic to it, and they believe that they've got some sort of capacity in that in that specific country to help you actually build your business, which is why they're typically looking to invest. Yeah, so probably go to an investment group rather than a VC, probably. A VC will have rules on the fund and all sorts of stuff. But if you go to a group, yep. you know, an angel group or a wholesale investor, I think you're more likely as an international company. Anyway, there you go. Right, Sorry. and uh, then uh, the other question, a tactical question, uh, uh, for startups, they are uh, always uh, like uh, trying to see what is the right country to uh, open their company in, so to uh, to be uh, investment friendly. And the question is, uh, Delaware or Australia? <laughs> oh my God! Um, it depends how progressed you are. Is the first thing, but uh, you, you want to get close to your customers. I would say. So if you you know go go where your customers are and raise money where your customers are. So and that's you know because every business is different. But you know if 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 you're if like Sharon mentioned the accelerators at the Gold Coast sports the net the one coming after that I think is media and then it's tourism because that's what the Gold Coast is great at. So you know if you want to do sports media or tourism you're going to be you have a good accelerator and close to customers at the Gold Coast. If you want to do fintech, um, you're not going to find very many, um, you know, big finance organisations at the Gold Coast in Australia. They're going to be in Sydney or Melbourne. So just pick the location that makes sense, puts you close to your customers and close to the right experts, I would say. But right. damn, the Gold Coast is nice to live. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Um, but uh, just uh, finishing on this question, like, uh, in terms of IPs, uh, I think that's no problem to uh, start Delaware Corporation and do business in Australia and raise uh, capital uh, from Australian investors. That wouldn't be the problem. Uh, I think it would be the problem for US investors if it's structured in Australia. And so US investors are unlikely to invest in uh, the same way. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. It's less of a, it's less of a problem in Australia because you know we 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 need to look for further afield to find good opportunities because we're a smaller economy. It's less of a problem. However, if you're approaching a VC, they have rules around their funds, and there's there's a pretty good chance that they can't have a lot of international investments, if any. Um, so even if you're if you're a Delaware company, um, yeah, we'd love to hear from you, but but you probably should be approaching investment groups rather than an investment fund. That's what I recommend, in, including Steve's whole, wholesale investor. Um, you know, I listed three there, 1013, ourselves, 42 Ventures, wholesale investor uh, on market. I can't think of any others in Australia, Steve, uh, or Angel, Angel Groups. So, yeah. Great. Um, we have a question from uh, Australian entrepreneur. Um, oh, really? um, and uh, sensor-guided living, it seems. Uh, it seems like uh, an uh, Everest of uh, challenges uh, when you are uh, you have many B two B paths. 
how do you decide which ones uh, to go to first or do you just go for them all with small steps? Sharon, question. I'm not sure I understand the question. <laughs> Huh. Um, when you've got a field of opportunity, I mean, you tend to just go where the best opportunity is. So, um, you know. You want me to? Uh, yeah, yeah, you should go well, for it, Danny. Yeah, Where's I think, see, if, if a business has lots of opportunities, to me, that's a great business because probably, you know, things will fail. And, and then if you've, if you've got another opportunity to monetize and stay alive and be successful, then that's great. If there's only one way to make money out of a business and it's really early stage, I get nervous about that. Whereas if I look at something and I say, oh, wow, there's five or six ways to make money out of this, uh, then I think that's a good business. Um, and, but then, yes, you pick one um, because you, 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 I'm assuming you won't have the resources to do more. It's not, not a good idea anyway. Um, and Steve, you can add here. But um, again, I just get back to you pick the one where you're going to get a customer. And your customers follow your customers. Get a customer on whichever one it is. Um, it's really hard to cut off the other avenues, but you have to do it. You have to brand yourself concisely, especially at early stage, and be brave enough to do it. The others will come anyway. You can put a little, little bit in the background on your website or whatever, um, but you need to be pretty firm on what you're, what you're attacking or people won't, they're not going to get you. Um, Steve, you know. I'll just simplify and go momentum is the hardest thing in the world to build and that's why I do love the idea of just getting one customer then getting a second and then just continuing because like everyone it, you can tell when someone's super early in their entrepreneurial journey because they tell you five different things they're going to do all at one time and it's just you look at it and go that's just all too much or the or the or the founder that I had one the other day where he was basically like, he actually said, I'm too busy to raise money because I'm raising money for another inventor I'm involved in. And I'm like, well, how do you even do that? Like, a, like I know how much energy I put into Wholesale Investor. I know how much energy Sharon, you know, would put into building up Mantic. It's like how, you know, it's so momentum, just focus on getting momentum in one direction as a starting point because there's always going to be other... Look, there's no, once you start a business, there's never a shortage of opportunities, right? It's just get momentum to start with. Yeah, and if you look at like an example, I'm chairman of Atmantec, 150,000 organizations use the software. The challenge is getting people off free stuff onto commercial stuff. Um, so we had, a, I'm chairman, we had a conversation this morning, which was around, we don't have enough mid-market commercial customers. Too many of the mid-market clients are using the free software, okay? And we basically ended up, well, okay, if the mid-market's not using that much, then let's forget the mid-market and let's brand ourselves software for big companies, telcos, service providers, managed service providers, right? So even for us, like we're, even for Opmantech, with, with over 100,000 organisations, it's still about you've got to let, be brave enough to let that opportunity go and pick an area to focus on. Define yourself. Define yourself by the, the customers that want to get you buy your software or buy your stuff. Right. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, the answer is also makes life much easier. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, it's public. <laughs> yeah. Like, who said building a business was easy? It's an endless wrestle. <laughs> True. Uh, on the previous question, uh, we still have some or more uh, 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 some, someone from Eastern Europe, which Slav Lukin is asking, uh, uh, do I have to transfer IP to Australia company if I have registered IP on a local company already? Um, no. Um, so it depends, depends what you're trying to do and what structure you want to want to set up. Um, um, but no, I mean, you, you can have, there's lots of different structures. It depends what your purpose is. If you're trying to raise money in Australia, um, you, you, well, if you're trying to raise money anywhere, typically the money goes into the head entity. I'm sure Steve would agree. So, um, so you'd want the head entity to probably be Australian and you'd want the entity that owns the IP to be a subsidiary. It doesn't have to be in the Australian entity. It could sit overseas. 
but you'd want it to be under the Australian entity. Depends on what you're trying to do. If you just want to establish in Australia, then no, I wouldn't move the IP to Australia if you just want to establish here and build the business here. And a lot of the government incentives and other incentives are based around um, if you if you have resources here and you have an Australian company, most of them don't require the company to be the head office company. Some of them require the majority of your resources to be here. A few require I to be, IP to be here, but you know, depends what you're doing, but generally speaking, no, I know. All right. Any... Um, um, a question to all speakers. Are there any uh, cultural aspects, um, uh, cultural context of Australia that uh, affects B2B in comparison with other countries? Can I just answer for a different cultural one? I saw it on there earlier. Uh, it's sort of come down now, but someone was talking about Asia and the Middle East. I can't speak about the Middle East, but I can definitely speak about Asia because I've been going there for the last seven years. Absolutely, relationship is every. It's like I don't drink much. The only place I drink is when I'm in Singapore because entertainment and it's like you do your nine to five meetings and that's normal business. If someone invites you to an after hours conversation, whether it be drinks, whether it be dinner, then you know that they're interested in a strategic relationship beyond, uh, beyond just you know, a, a normal chat. So um, you know, I'll, I'll let sort of Danny and Shara answer the Australian one, but absolutely with Asia, there's so many interesting uh, aspects to the, to the relationship side. I, I would, mm. I would um, well, Sharon, you can... Oh, I was just going to say, I, I totally agree. Like um, most of Southeast Asia are, are relationship driven cultures. So it is about creating that rapport, an individual rapport uh, with key stakeholders that are going to purchase the software um, and, and they are buying you more than they're buying the actual product to begin with. So, um, to, and I totally agree with the, your comments around, yeah, that's, um, it, that's when the business is done, uh, is absolutely in those meetings after hours when you can really yeah. talk and form connections. But for, from, the, from the Australian business culture perspective, compared to others, um, we're fairly straight talking sometimes. Um, yeah. Sometimes that can come across as arrogant or, um, or, or rude even. Um, but but you, you know where you stand. You can form relationships really quickly in Australia, um, especially through place, places like the hub, a lot, a lot quicker I find than other places. And I don't think that's because I'm Australian. Um, but you still got to form them. Like it still takes work. It's not like you turn up and everyone's your best friend. Um, but you can go to events and form relationships easier than other places. When you go to sell your product, you don't tend to have as much time wasted as you would in some other, other places. People tend to be pretty straight, pretty direct. Uh, people tend to value their time really highly here. So they don't want to waste time with something they're not going to buy. And that does allow you to cut through a lot of stuff. And we tend to be less scared of new technologies than some places as, as, as well. So um, it's a good culture for, for, for a, a, new, a, a new high growth business, I think, compared to others. Yeah. Thank you so much, guys. I will also read uh... Um, uh, comment on the previous question uh, from Debbie. I would say there are issues with cultural differences. I was uh, recently asked this in Asia and Middle East countries, relationship building is still very important. With many Asian Middle Eastern countries, there, are, uh, there is responsibility for their staff before dividing uh, the dividends of investors. Very different to how investors countries work. Yeah, uh, well, um, I think we had an amazing session. Uh, you are a very experienced and uh, definitely the right people for global founders to share your expertise and uh, really, really grateful for, for your time and your expertise. Um, everyone, please uh, research more about Wholesale Investors, Gold Coast Innovation Hub, uh, and the 42 Ventures. Uh, those are great organizations from Australia that are willing to help you uh, entrepreneurs to uh, enter Australian market and scale globally. And uh, definitely, if you would have more questions to our speakers, uh, to Steve, Danny, and Sharon, reach uh, us out at Go Global World. Uh, uh, we will help you to connect with them if there is a mutual interest. And uh, let's start with you, Sharon. What would be your final, uh, um, uh, final words? Final words. Um, for B2B startups um, that are tuning in tonight, I guess they would be um, to uh, make sure they cr create your own 
Um, so create your own social proof, I guess, is one of the main things, which I didn't touch on too well. But, um, but yeah, have your case studies, um, have proof, uh, like proof of what you've done in the market. So, and, um, and yeah, be ready to, to back yourself and present yourself. And don't be afraid to reach out to other organizations to help you. It's particularly in Australia, um, there's lots of innovation hubs. There is great support from government, as was mentioned in Danny's slides, um, which um, can help to make those initial introductions um, and actually sort of um, uh, 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 concierge your first conversations with some of these um, companies. So, um, so yeah, so um, make sure you've got your, get, get your pitch deck together, make sure you've got some evidence of what you can do and yeah, get out there. Thank you, Sharon. Steve? Uh, my one is just from the pure capital raising perspective. It's an absolutely emotional journey. Uh, when an investor says that they're going to go ahead, you feel like you're bulletproof for that moment. And then when they say that they're not going to go ahead, you feel like you're this big. Um, so just understand that that is completely normal. Also, rejection is also completely normal. And I, I think if you have the focus of thinking about capital raising as a typical marketing and sales process, then that will suit you a lot better going forward because you're, you'll take away a whole lot of pressure for yourself and don't let people pressure you into thinking that everyone raises capital within two to three months because very few actually do, like less than 5%. So, Thank you, Steve. And Danny? Okay, since on the last comment, I'll have to say thank, thanks to you, Daniil, and Go Global World. You know, um, it's a great thing that you're doing and, you know, all of us are on this call because we're passionate about the, um, you know, the very things that you're promoting and doing internationally. So really glad that we can, can link up. Um, my final words, I guess, um, would be to the, to the entrepreneurs is that um, if, you, if you're one of the people listening here that has a business which has a specific advantage and that, that advantage can be anything. It might be that you're creating a, a pair of socks and, you're, and you're, your mum or dad or best friend has the biggest chain of sock stores in Europe, um, then that gives you an advantage because you're going to get them through the stores. You know, if you're one of those people that has a, a product with a feature or a relationship or something that gives you an advantage over someone else, then go for it. And if you're one of the people who don't know yet what your advantage is, then find it or do something else because you, you, your business has to have a specific advantage for you to leverage. So find it and go for it. And if you can't find it, do something else. That would be my advice. I love it. Go for it. That was uh, Danny Mayer, uh, Sharon Honeywell, and Steve Torsa. Guys, I think we nailed it. The topic is definitely uncovered. High five to you. And uh, everyone on YouTube, uh, please uh, share this uh, stream, uh, leave uh, us comments, and uh, definitely subscribe and uh, give us some likes. And we'll see you soon. Thank you, everyone, and have a great